I'm just going to read from the paper here. I did submit this in email to the council as well. Um, I wasn't real comfortable speaking about this because there has been some animosity online towards uh, rental housing providers. So I'd like that just put into the record. Um, council members, thank you for your time. My name's Joe and I provide house rental housing in the following Lexington districts. District one, I have 15 units. All of these are under fair market rent values as established by HUD. I have two units in district two, four units in district three, one unit in district 11. For 22 plus years, I've worked to provide my family and my community value by buying, rehabbing, and renting homes. My hands have personally resurrected multiple properties, rejuvenated entire streets and neighborhoods, which has increased the tax base while providing homes for people. I work with my renters directly. They have my cell phone number and my email address, and I respond. I want to give you today as my point of view on why this tenant bill of rights is a bad choice for Lexington and will only exacerbate things by making housing less affordable. As a rental housing provider, RHP, RHP, I'm not a landlord. I provide approximately 200 renters safe, secure, and affordable housing around Central Kentucky. My average rent is under $1,000 per month for a single family home, and it's around $600 a month for a multifamily home. I was born in here in Lexington in the 1970s. I'm the youngest of eight children, 10 years after my closest sibling. I grew up in what most would call very poor in a house on Lexington's north side where my family had lived since 1957. My father died when I was in third grade, so that home had become a single mother household raising my nephew and myself and other brothers and sisters rotating through because they were much older. We got by on my mom's cashier's salary and a small SSI benefit because my father was a veteran. Bills were intermittently paid on a rotating basis. It was always a struggle for her to make ends meet. We ate a lot of government cheese and drank powdered milk or Kool-Aid pretty much exclusively. Food stamps helped provide some basics occasionally. Fast forward through lots of things that make me glad cell phones didn't exist back then and on into my mid twenties. My mother had been sick for over a few years and it was obvious she was not coming home to live by herself. She was in debt due to medical bills and a loan and had no money or estate to speak of other than the house. As a family, we were preparing to let the house go to bankruptcy foreclosure to settle her debts. With that said, I'm sympathetic to the issues that have led us to this point in time. Through fate and a partner that recognized opportunity, we were able to purchase my family home before it sold to foreclosure. This allowed mom to settle her bankruptcy and all of her bills. We took a huge risk and we were going to try to rehab it as our own first home. The house was in severe disrepair. The tub had collapsed into the crawl space. The roof and the windows were failing and allowing water in. Squirrels and snakes had taken over the entire backside of the house. It was in horrible shape and uninhabitable. It was in such bad condition that the first appraiser we had told us verbatim, tear it down, it's a detriment to the lot. He was right, that would have proven much easier. Instead, my partner and I spent literally the next two years working on it ourselves before it was anywhere near a livable condition. Nights, weekends, quote unquote vacations, or any extra money we had went into repairing this home. We did 99% of this ourselves, despite me never having even owned power tools before beginning this misadventure. My first birthday present from my partner after the purchase of the house was a trip to Sears to buy a circular saw and some hand tools. We lived in this home for three years before I lost my job. I found a new job in a nearby town and we had planned to sell the house and move there. The idea of renting was brought up and we decided that we could try it and if it didn't work it, we could still sell. All that background just to say this, forcing hundreds of local small business owners that repair these derelict, blighted or otherwise unsuitable properties to make them functional homes again out of business will have a host of consequences. As a government representative and as an individual, you will not be able to claim them as unintended. You have been warned of what will happen if this passes. Your actions from this point forward will at least have this consequence. Housing will be less affordable for the residents of Lexington. Lexington is a unique city that's flown under the radar of large institutional investors thus far. It's not technically in the Sun Belt where they target. It has actual winners. It's been largely ignored as a flyover country for the out-of-state and institutional investors, despite being affordable. What they didn't realize is we have a strong university, a great community, wonderful tourism, a solid job market, are incredibly diverse with an inclusive fairness city ordinance of 23 years, and we're just ranked in the top 4% for equality, being number one in Kentucky. Lexington ranks high in surveys of great cities to live in. It recently came in 36 in a list that was published today. It's big enough, yet it still feels small. It has never been subjected to the wild swings in housing prices like the coasts or other areas of the country. The majority of the rental housing providers live and work near the city, not in some corporate office in San Francisco using an algorithm to determine their best profit margins. 
Read the Herald Leader's recent hit, hit piece on the people that are currently doing the work buying, rehabbing, and renting or selling homes with a new life and a greatly increased taxable value. The majority of them live in or very close to Lexington. As a city, we have not fallen victim to the whims of those that want for everything while providing nothing in return yet. The Tenant Bill of Rights puts us directly on that path. It wishes to eliminate source of income discrimination. This will force rental housing providers to do business with government agencies that are notoriously slow and incredibly non-responsive to issues. This friction causes many delays. Only One only needs to look at government-funded programs like colleges or healthcare or the military for proof that their involvement in paying only results in increased costs over time. This will affect people without government vouchers the most and hardest. They will be even less able to compete with voucher holders or free market renters. Increased paperwork, notices, inspections, and the lack of responsiveness all slow the rental process and create burdens for housing providers. The associated costs will pass directly to the renter, make housing less affordable. It wishes to eliminate criminal background checks. These are necessary for the protection of both the housing provider and the community. People have a right to know if they are living next door to a child molester, a rapist, violent or otherwise felonious offender. Recidivism rates for people with felony convictions is incredibly high, 60 to 80% for most crimes. The Public Housing Authority conducts criminal background checks and does not allow people with convictions like these. Why should rental housing providers be forced to do so? It wishes to eliminate credit scores as qualifying criteria. Getting a mortgage, a car loan, or a credit card with low or no credit scores is difficult. However, there have been recent changes to these processes for credit scores. The changes make a more accurate score available by using good payment history for items not previously considered and by lowering negative impacts of certain items like medical debt or student loan debt. Credit score is important because the best indicator of future performance is past performance. If credit scores are disallowed, rental housing providers' ability to mitigate risk will take a huge hit. More risk always means higher costs. This cost will spread to all renters, making housing less affordable. It wishes to eliminate eviction history. As mentioned before, the best indicator of future performance is past performance. While the number of actual evictions is incredibly hard to pin down for various reasons, the easy, there are easy trends to see. A single person can be responsible for dozens of eviction filings, but they may only represent one house that's lost to an eviction, even if they are actually removed from the house. Most evictions won in court do not actually result in the person being removed from the house. Restricting rental housing providers from considering evictions once again increases risk tremendously. Any increase in risk results in an increase in cost, and that cost gets spread amongst all renters and makes housing less affordable. It wishes to eliminate immigration status. National origins is already a protected class. It wishes to establish a landlord registry. This has been considered in the past and has always been deemed a bad idea by the city council. It is. There are already multiple agencies tasked with ensuring all properties are up to code and habitable. Renters are free and actually protected from retaliation to report code or other issues to the appropriate city offices. Renters do not want a renter registry as that would be ripe for abuse and most likely illegal as a form of libel or blackballing. The same is true for housing providers. Someone has made a registry of landlords themselves online already. Reddit is a constant source of anti-landlord sentiments, including threats of violence, personal tax, and more. If such registries are formed by government, the cost for these will be passed to the renters, making housing less affordable. It wishes to establish a right to counsel. The renter and the rental housing provider have the same right to counsel right now, except one always has to pay for it and one doesn't through access to legal aid, legal clinic, etc. I tried contacting these agencies during COVID for assistance navigating the Healthy at Home funds, and I was told they never take rental housing provider case asides, they only take on renters. Since September of 2011, any eviction case filed in Fayette County requires an attorney to file it if the property is held in a business entity. This is the main reason statistics that get thrown around about the lack of renters' legal representation about causes for evictions are incorrect. We are forced to use attorneys. It costs us to use attorneys. We cannot file the evictions per personally if it's held in a business name. There are two reasons renters lose the majority of eviction cases. One, they do not show up to court as they most likely know they have no defense because two, the vast majority of eviction cases, approximately 92% in Fayette County, are easy to prove as they are for non-payment of rent. The right to counsel's only objective is to slow down the already exceedingly drawn out eviction process. Pre-COVID, it was an average of 45 days from the time of service to the time the person was removed from the house. Since then, even with measurably lower eviction case numbers, it's close, to, it's close to 60 plus days before the renter has to leave and the housing provider gets possession of their property. 
If you were caught shoplifting an Xbox from Walmart, the store immediately gets their property back and the offender goes to jail with a felony charge potentially. In an eviction case, the offender gets to steal an entire house for two or three months and faces no criminal charges, only civil charges or fines, which are rarely collected. Summing up what another rental housing provider said, if there's a bread shortage, we don't solve it by registering bakers, restricting the amount of bread they can bake, charge them a per loaf inspection fee, and then tell them they have to charge less for it and give everyone a smaller slice. Some people think that if there's a housing shortage, the solution is to make it harder and more expensive to build new housing or to increase the cost of existing housing, tell people who and how they have to do business and how much they can charge. It takes longer to build a house than it does to bake bread, but the cycles of shortages, absent government interference, are the same. Prices go up, which makes individuals jump into the business, which increases competition, which creates more supply, which absorbs the demand, which makes prices go down. Government could become an active participant by building or buying more public housing. Instead, it chooses to target existing housing providers with measures like this, forcing them into unwilling partnerships. The only real solution to any shortage is to make whatever, more of whatever is in short supply. These types of policies have never proven effective. One just needs to look at what they do to the markets where they have been implemented. California, New York, Oregon, Louisville. Is the housing solutions there? Are they better or worse than in Lexington? Know this, any funding paid for this will be ill-spent and is paid by those least able to afford it, yet it still does not address the root cause. There is not enough housing in Lexington. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next is Frank Harris. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Frank Harris. I'm, uh, I'm 60 years old. I've lived in Lexington my whole life, and I'm here to speak on the uh, license plate reader issue. I'm not here to, to, to argue the merits of the, of the bill itself. What I, wanna, I want you all to consider doing is um, adding these things to the bill so that there is a period of time for evaluation and possibly repeal. My concern is, is that so many laws get passed that are bad laws and they never go away. They're on the books forever. I think the ice cream law that, you know, about putting an ice cream cone in your back pocket. So it, 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 it's in Lexington, Kentucky. That's where that law was written. It's still on the books to my knowledge. That's a hundred year old law. Um, so what I would like for you to consider is putting this into any new law or new regulation that you have. One, the stated purpose of the new law or rule, uh, the criteria for measuring the success or failure of the new law or the new, new uh, rule, a promise to review the success or failure with citizens' input and an opportunity uh, for debate on the findings of the success or failure of the new law or rule, and most importantly, a sundown clause on any new law or regulation which would automatically trigger having to go through a, a revote to consider re-implementing that rule or law uh, so that we can stop adding bad laws to the books. And I would like to cede uh, the remainder of my time to Clay Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clay Davis. And so you'll have a minute 26 left from Mr. Harris, and so that's four minutes and 26 seconds. Welcome. <clears throat> Greetings, Mayor and distinguished council members, one and all. My name is Clay Davis. I'm the director of We See You Watching Lexington, a local grassroots organization concerned with the use of surveillance in our community. I also live in District 8. I'd like to share some concerns with you today regarding the flock camera expansion and surveillance in general. Though some of my points may relate to things you have previously discussed, it is my hope that I will call your attention to some things you may not have considered, if you will only indulge me to the end. During a recent Council work session, Police Chief Weathers made some deceptive remarks 
regarding the flock cameras, and I wanted to set the record straight. The chief stood here before you in council chambers and publicly said, we have a policy to regulate the cameras. Nobody else thought of that. Your police department thought of that because it's worried about people's rights. That statement is blatantly false. My organization has been asking this council for a comprehensive surveillance policy, one that would ensure complete transparency and accountability for all government surveillance devices and technology since 2017. That's five years. We even have a sample ordinance drafted by the ACLU that the city could use as a template to craft a policy that fits our community. Many of you, if not all of you, have previously received a PDF copy of this proposed ordinance. No one has taken the steps to put it forward. Currently, there are 13 major cities in the United States that have accepted and adopted an identical or similar ordinance recognizing that mature, modern, smart cities need these types of protections in place for their respective communities. The current policy touted by Chief Weathers falls far short of protecting the rights of Lexingtonians in comparison with this proposed ordinance. Lexington now lives in a fishbowl of police GPS trackers, encrypted phone cracking software, fixed cameras in our parks, body worn cameras, traffic cameras, license plate reading cameras, aerial drone cameras, the Amazon Ring doorbell program that allows police to use our doorbells as cameras, and a 29 camera super secret camouflaged police surveillance program that Chief Weathers refuses to acknowledge even exists. Wow. When you say all of that out loud, it begins to sound like we are well on our way to being an overly surveilled community. This, I think, is what Vice Mayor Kay was referring to at the recent council work session when he discussed that folks concerned about their privacy being invaded in any number of ways in which they have no control. Our proposed ordinance alleviates and remedies these privacy concerns and establishes reporting standards that this and future councils would find useful when doing the diligence that Council Member Kloiber brought forth at the last work session. I agree with Council Member James Brown that policy is what is going to protect our community, and I believe this council can do more. I recommend that this proposed ordinance be provided to and reviewed by the Racial Justice and Equality Commission to determine if they feel that it is a viable policy for our community. From the tone of the council's recent discussions, Lexington will not be reducing or eliminating the technologies it currently has in place. License plate readers will likely expand dramatically in number in the coming year. When Councilmember Reynolds advocates for extremely costly and expensive tools such as ShotSpotter, it signals to our community that the council intends on continually increasing the scope with which we are being surveilled. Excuse me, your time is up. May I ask for one minute to close? Yes, council. So moved. Thank you, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Lamb. All those in favor say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? All right, you have one minute. Thank you, council members. As te technology improves, we can expect more and more invasive devices to be introduced into our community. For all the potential upside, there is also a potential for abuse. Despite assurances from current leadership, we have no guarantees how future leadership might employ these devices without a comprehensive ordinance in place. If any of you feel that you have been placed in a difficult position with your constituents with regard to striking a balance between public safety and privacy rights, this ordinance is the very tool with which you can accomplish that in your respective districts. Your leadership on this issue would be placing Lexington among the cities that pioneered privacy protection, and this is a critical moment for our city, and the time to do the right thing is now. 
I strongly urge the council to reconsider this proposed ordinance on behalf of those in our community that are concerned with the negative implications associated with living in an overly surveilled society. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Next is Miranda, excuse me, sorry. The council rules are that people need to listen and um, please no clapping. Um, Miranda Henchman, welcome. Thank you. I want to commend you guys. I don't know how you do this on a regular basis to have the will and the um, knowledge and the intensity for it because it's, it's a lot of people with a lot of opinions. Um, I'm here actually as a property owner. Um, I don't necessarily call myself a landlord, although that's obviously the term we use. I really care about my tenants. Um, just this year, I had one tenant that got behind. They had a brand new baby and he reached out to me and he said, we're just gonna be late, we need more time. And I said, you know what, absolutely. That happened two more times and I still helped them. That young couple's back on their feet with a young child. I have another young family with two small children that lives in the right side of my duplex. And on the left side, I had three people that moved in. Of those three, two left, that's a whole other story. And I said to my girl, I see that you're struggling to pay rent. Let's get this all figured out. Let's get it all squared away. And let me, let me let you out of this so that you can find something more affordable. As far as the tenants' rights proposed, that's hard for someone like me because the truth of the matter is I care about my tenants. I care about their rights. I want them to have a nice place to live. I want them to be happy. I want them to stay as long as they want and be great tenants. And I want them to be safe. If I can't screen tenants, what do I say to the young family that lives on the right side of that duplex that has two small children? I manage all of my stuff. When I go into a property, if I'm not very familiar with my tenant and I haven't been able to check a criminal background, do you think I'm gonna be comfortable going in and changing out the filter? I do some of that stuff. So I'm just here to say that if you, if you make it really difficult, or let me say this, because I can deal with difficult. If you make it really high risk, I'm not going to take on that risk. I'm not gonna be stuck with a tenant that makes me feel unsafe or makes my other tenants out of respect feel unsafe. I think it's important that I be able to judge the risk involved, both financially, physically, and otherwise. And if it's too high risk, I will just sell my properties. And there won't be someone like me who owns that cares about when my tenants had a new baby or they change jobs and they're behind and be able to give that grace and work through it. I just, I won't be able to accept that risk. So. And no offense, I also don't need advice on how to be a good human and just be kind to people and give them grace when they need it. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Would you say for the record yeah. your council district, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, Division 4 is where I live. And then I have a, the duplex is in Division 4. And then um, it's like a five-bedroom condo that the young couple lives in. But they were students at UK before all their roommates moved out and they had their baby. That's so fine. It's, yeah. Thank you very right. much. <laughs> Reva Russell English. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Reva Russell English. I live in the first district. Um, I'm never entirely sure what angle I should take when I'm talking about my reasons that I oppose the proposed expansion of the Flock Automatic License Plate Reader Program. Um, because I'm always going to be in opposition to increased government and corporate surveillance of myself and my neighbors when we're just going about living our lives. So there's that. But there's more than just that that discourages me about the resolution this body might pass tonight. And part of it is the way in which the program kind of seems like it's doing something about crime. Now, if the data that has been given to us, the limited data from LPD is correct, there have been some wins on the backside of a crime that has already occurred. But none of us, if we could pick, would choose to have our stolen car recovered if we could live in a place where it wouldn't have been stolen in the first place. But it isn't just that the funding this program means that we only react to crime instead of funding program services and organizations that might in fact prevent crime and harm. It's also that we, the public, and some of you, our elected officials have worked so hard to gain a little bit of oversight, accountability, and transparency in regards to our police department. It is astonishing to me that you are now considering reducing what little we have gained to put forward an entirely new surveillance program where we have no idea what our police department is doing with it. 
It's bad policy. I know that many of you trust our police chief, and I hear that. But we shouldn't put policies in place that rely on people to do the right thing. We are being asked once again to trust that the police will use the program in the way that they're supposed to, and we don't want to. We don't want to trust the police. We want to know that they are following the rules, and the only way we can do that is by having oversight, accountability, and transparency. And it's also not the nature of the relationship that we have with the police to be trusting. After all, they're surveilling us. How does that build trust? This harms the few gains that we have made in regards to oversight. We had massive protests in 2020 about this very thing. Please don't take steps back in that regard. And then there's the money. Policing always seems to need more money. Our police department has never had more money than they have now. Last year, they had never had more money than they'd had that year, the year before, and so on. In fact, nothing in modern history in Lexington has ever been as well-funded as our police department. But it's never enough, and for some reason, it's also never, ever related to outcomes. At the same time, we throw peanuts at the organizations doing the work that could prevent crime and harm. $1,000 here, $5,000 there. Can you imagine what some of our organizations could do with the quarter million dollars you want to do to expand this program? Fund prevention, fund people and their needs, don't fund surveillance, and please pass the Tenants' Bill of Rights. Can you imagine being a renter in Lexington right now? Thank you very much. Tyson Carroll. Welcome. Hello. My name is Tyson Carroll. <clears throat> I live in the third district. Uh, I've been a Lexingtonian for 20 years, 20 plus years, and I've worked for our police department for 13. I am responsible, I maintain and I oversee the unit responsible for the LPR program for our license plate readers. Um, I spend a majority of my time as a Lexington investigator investigating violent crimes, murders, assaults, rapes, those types of things. I consider myself a victim advocate first and foremost. And I've sat through tough family meetings, meetings with the victims, where they've asked for us to do more. They've never asked for us to do less. For victims where they have, they have not once said, I wish there was less evidence available. I want to share with you a story, uh, or a couple stories. Recently, a victim was sexually assaulted here in Lexington by a stranger. Private surveillance allowed for us to get a video capture of the suspect vehicle. The victim gave us a description of the suspect. Specifically, and only with the LPR program, we were able to identify the vehicle, give that lead to investigators for them to corroborate, investigate, and arrest the suspect for that. We can't say if that prevents more crimes, but that person isn't out there to do that crime again right now. Today, due to LPR, we were able to safely arrest a suspect of felony assault where the warrant was issued six days ago. Now that time may not mean much, but in my career, six days is a pretty fast turnaround for us to be able to safely arrest somebody, to bring some justice to a victim of a felonious assault. Six days, that's pretty quick. I come to you today as a resident. I live here. I work here, I play here in Lexington, my family drives these streets, I drive these streets, my best friends drive these streets, and I'm telling you I am okay with my data being there. I'm okay with my family's data being there. I'm okay with my best friend's license plates being on the system. I am a champion for victims, and with this, I can do more. I can help victims, and that's what I want this program for. So I ask you to pass this measure. Please fund the expansion of the program. I will continue to be there. I'll continue to be responsible for it. You all know who I am, and I'm there to answer any questions. Thank you for my time. Thank you. Andrew Russell English. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council. My name is Andrew Russell English. I'm in District 1. Um, and I don't really want to talk about why we should or shouldn't install the 100 plot cameras throughout the streets to read our license plates as we drive around the city. Um, I'm not really ready to weigh whether or not we should send a quarter million dollars to Colorado to a venture capital company that's not yet even profitable. 
That's because I wasn't given any time or actual data by my city government or police department to make that kind of informed decision. What I am ready to talk about is trust, something that's built slowly and broken in an instant. Our police department and this very council pay lip service to the need for a better and more trusting relationship between citizens and public servants. As a Lexingtonian, I was promised that this pilot program would be allowed to run its course of one year after the last camera was installed in August, giving us at least a small foundation upon which to base this huge expenditure of public money. The motion on the table today will break that trust. I was encouraged when Lexington added two civilians to a police disciplinary review board and banned no knocks in the city. Both of these choices made the city a safer place to be for racialized folks who live or travel through Lexington. They also started to build a different kind of relationship between residents and police. The motion on the table will break that trust. In general, I feel this council could do a little more to engage residents in the process of legislation in Lexington. But trying to sneak a 300% expansion of this program through at the last meeting of this council for the year, or ever, without the promised pilot period, five o'clock on a Tuesday, it's a new low. Reminds me of the last minute attempted amendment to the no-knock ban that some of you will probably remember. I'm not ready to talk about this expanding the flock reader program because I wrote this on my lunch break and I had to get back to the job site so I could leave early to come to this meeting. Do the thing you're supposed to do, please, and vote to make this decision later. Let the pilot program run. Thank you. Next is Lamonte Shively. Welcome. Hi, my name is Lamonte. Uh, I live in District 1, and I want to talk about the Tenants Bill of Rights. Um, after finishing my time at UK last December, uh, I moved to Louisville for work, but shortly after I moved there, uh, I quit my job there in favor of doing uh, grocery delivery with my car. Um, that was going well until my car unexpectedly broke. Uh, after applying for over 700 jobs in three months, uh, I had no money, I was using SNAP benefits to get by, and I fell into a deep depression. After I exhausted my family and friends of their generous support, my mental health couldn't take it and I was evicted and I moved back to Lexington. Now that's just my story. Did I deserve my eviction? Yeah, I didn't pay my rent. Um, but I was lucky enough to be 22 with no dependents, little responsibility, and a, a good support system around me. I learned a lesson there. And because of that lesson, the opposition to the Tenants' Bill of Rights makes my blood boil. Just yesterday, uh, a post made in a Facebook group with over 8,000 real estate members uh, was made. The subject was, don't Louisville up our Lexington. Said in the post was, quote, they being the council, have already heard the socialist housing is a human right crowd, and quote, the avowed socialists that have pushed it this far are planning to pack the chambers, so we need to be present as well. I'm not a socialist, I'm not even involved with the protest outside, I didn't know that was happening, but when did housing become a socialist issue? We're all taught that the four basic human needs are food, water, air, and shelter. Doesn't it only make sense to afford those basic protections for the renters that need them most? I'm sure lots of renters would love to have these protections, and I'm sure that most renters would love to be here in support of this bill. Being honest, they probably just got out of traffic. Last Thursday, Councilwoman Lamb said that being a part of the council and its achievements and touching lives was an honor that she wished that everyone could experience. Mayor Gordon and the council, I want to ask you on behalf of people who have also went through a time of struggle to move forward with the Tenants' Bill of Rights. The entitled and privileged argument for, quote unquote, their Lexington should not trample the equitability, basic need, and preventative action that would impact thousands of men, women, and children in a growing city in favor of a few's bottom line. I'd venture to guess that people, that this would have uh, the biggest effect on aren't here. So it is on all of you to act in their best interest by moving forward with this bill. It could positively impact the lives of thousands and it'd be better to do that than bow down to the few who oppose. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Amber Duke, welcome. Thank you, good evening. My name is Amber Duke. I'm interim executive director at the ACLU of Kentucky. We are based in Louisville, but represent uh, our members across your districts. I would like to state for the record that the ACLU of Kentucky does not support license plate readers such as flock cameras. Before the pilot launched, we along with the NAACP and Human Relations Commission were invited by the mayor's office to meet with the Lexington Police Department to ask questions and share concerns about this technology. We shared our concerns about over-policing in communities of color, privacy and data storage, and the lack of guardrails to prevent unnecessary future expansions, and the lack of civilian oversight and accountability. Many of our concerns were addressed in the policy guiding the pilot project, and I want to thank Chief Eric Lowe in particular for his listening ear and incorporation of my organization's policy suggestions in the final policy that's currently in place. Like many that you've heard from tonight, I was also surprised to hear of the recent announcement of the dramatic expansion of the program. At the time of the announcement, I had not been invited back to discuss the pilot, nor had the memo of the first quarterly audit been published. I reached out to Chief Lowe, and within 30 minutes, he responded, looping in Commander Greathouse, and we were able to meet last Thursday. During that discussion, I shared questions community members have asked us about basic operation of the cameras. I asked questions about the data that is being updated on, the L on LPRs on the transparency page. I raised concerns about the department sharing LPR data with five dozen other police agencies with no policy requirements or review of the requesting agencies. I was given clarification of the differences between the 25 camera pilot, the expansion proposal, and the National Police Institute study. It was a good conversation and I'm committed to continuing conversations with the department. I said to them what I will say to, hear, to you here today. The ACLU of Kentucky recommends the council a lot more time for information gathering and discussion before moving this expansion request forward. The community has questions. The results of the first quarterly audit were just published this afternoon around 1 p.m. While I received prompt personal notification this memo was posted, it is not sufficient time for public review and questions. Parts of the program, like the data sharing between agencies, deserves more thoughtful conversation and additional policy. The ACLU of Kentucky is opposed to spending taxpayer dollars to increase police surveillance full stop. We believe it is a waste of resources that will not serve Lexington well. We must combat crime with evidence-based programs and investments that address its root causes, which are poverty, housing insecurity, access to physical and mental health care, child care, and more. Thank you for considering this testimony. Thank you very much. Candace Kenchik. Candace, are you here? All right. Emma Anderson. Welcome. Hi, I'm Emma Anderson, and I'm in the first district. Um, I am a renter in Lexington. I have rented in the first district and now I'm renting in the fifth district. In May, I was evicted. I could not find an affordable place to move. I didn't have the time I needed to search while working full time. I ended up couch surfing for six months and it completely destabilized my life. I missed bills, a traffic court date, letters from my friends uh, because I was staying in so many places. I have roots in Lexington, I went to high school here, and I don't have any kids, but thinking about how much harder that situation would have been if I'd had kids in school and no network of people to stay with makes me really upset. Tonight you will be hearing from many Kentucky Tenants members, and every one of us has struggled as a renter in this city. We come to you today to explain why we need your support on a Tenants Bill of Rights. Um, we chose to focus on the four policies included based on thousands of conversations with renters and years of research on state and federal law and local models. To, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Tenants' Bill of Rights, I wanted to briefly run over the parts. 
First, we want a source of income discrimination ban. Our members have struggled to find places that will accept their housing assistance, and we know from service providers that they have the same problems. Um, public housing jurisdictions with laws banning source of income discrimination had vou voucher utilization rates five to 12 per points percentage points higher than those without the laws. Based on these results, um, an area, uh, a city with 10,000 vouchers served an additional 500 to 1,200 families with available funds. Um, we also want other anti-discrimination measures, for example, um, tenants with eviction records, criminal rep records, low credit scores, and immigration statuses, that all of whom face excessive barriers to finding housing. Two, we want tenants on all the commissions and boards to, that make housing decisions in our city. The complete list of these boards um, is on the do a document that we'll follow up in an email with. We want a landlord registry. Tenants should be able to know who their landlords are. They can run background checks on us, so we should have an accessible way to track them, and it's all, all public information anyways. We want the registry to include things like code enforcement violations, tenant complaints and eviction filings. And finally, we want every ten tenant in eviction court to have a lawyer. We know that nationally around 90% of landlords have representation while only 1% of tenants do. Lexington eviction court follows this pattern. Um, how could this ever be a system of justice? It's blatantly unfair and the outcomes reflect that. There's robust data that shows comprehensive right to counsel programs reduce costs for the city in the long run and lead to systemic change that keeps more people in their homes. We came here tonight to show you how much these protections mean to us and how greatly they could change our lives. We are upset while you are on break, we want you to think of us and we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Asan Gatewood. Welcome. Hi, my name, okay. Hi, my name is Asan Gatewood Parks. I'm a member of KY Tenants and my family rents here in Lexington in the second district. We used to be in the fifth district. I am 15 years old. Most of you have heard me speak at a city council meeting in October. I am here because my family and my city needs a tennis bill of rights. I live with my mom, sister, and little brother. I've worked at Sea Leaf and Soul to Go restaurant in the summer and I go to school at Carter G. Wilson Academy. I like art, singing, dancing, making novels, and playing video games. But this year, my family has had trouble with our housing. It has made my life a lot more stressful. We were evicted earlier in the year just because our landlord decided he wanted to sell our home. Now my mom is paying double what she used to pay in rent. And the place we moved into needs a lot of repairs. Every single part of the Tenants Bill of Rights would help us. A ban on source of income discrimination would have made our housing search so much better. Right in council and eviction court and permanent rental assistant would reduce the stress we all feel. My mom, my sister, me, and everyone when we get an eviction notice. A landlord registry would hold landlords accountable when they mistreat tenants and help us know who the good landlords are when we know when we are looking for a new place and seats for tenants on boards and commissions would give us more of a voice so we can implant implant implement, implement these social social solutions and more maybe you get lost in the policy, policy details but our housing system means that kids like me get less sleep it means we struggle more in school it means we can't enjoy our teenage years as much as we should, and you can change that. Please pass a Tennis Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephanie Hensley. Welcome. Thank you, my name is Stephanie Hensley and I live in District 5. 
I moved to Lexington from Corbin, Kentucky in 2021 because my friends and family told me that I would be able to find more opportunities for my family. I was hoping for a fresh start in here. Instead, my family has struggled to even have a roof over our heads. I used to live in District 1, now I live in District 5. I went from a bad apartment to another bad apartment. We were at Salvation Army and got an apartment at Matador North through Section 8. Kids got COVID, so we stayed in a hotel. And then finally, we got to move in thinking everything was fine. A year down the road, the health department said we had to leave because the black mold was so bad. So Section 8 took my voucher. Now I live in District 1. Now I live in District 5, and it went from worse to bad. There's open wires, the floor has cracks, there are holes in our closet, and I have two, a two-year-old. Knowing that my toddler can go in the closet at any time and grab wires stresses me out. The rent is $8.50 and the late fee is $100. We have to pay $45 extra because we don't make three times the rent. That doesn't make sense. I've had to walk five miles round trip to pay my rent. So we usually end up paying $9.50. Here recently, the office sent us emails saying we had to start paying rent online only. This is not an option for us because we get help from a local church and they only do checks. I had a feeling that me and my family was going to end up homeless. I have a newborn that's only two months old. If you were in my shoes, how would you feel being homeless with two kids and an infant? Having that stress always there wears on me. I'm 28 years old. I've had a heart attack. No mother should have that thought in the back of their head that they're going to be homeless with their kids soon. I want other tenants to know that they're not alone. Landlords need to understand that it's not only about them. It's about the community and it's about tenants. We are paying you and you should respect us instead of landlords taking advantage of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Charles Starks. Okay, Davida. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Davita Gatewood. I'm a leader with Kentucky Tenants, housing chair of the NAACP, a proud uh, graduate of the University of Kentucky, a mother of three sons in college, two kids in high school academies, and full-time caretaker of my youngest, who is functionally mentally disabled and I'm a renter here in Lexington. I've lived in Lexington all my life. I used to live in the fifth district. I am now a proud member of the second district. Most of you have heard my story. I'm here today because when you're a renter, just because you find a home doesn't mean things are fixed. It's one thing after another. Last week was the first of the month. Rent was due. Because of the rent increases in Lexington being among the highest in the nation, and rent increases nationwide being the highest in 40 years. I had to move to a place where my rent is now doubled what it was. Even though I have a housing choice voucher and should be paying only 30%, the housing authority miscalculated my income and is making me pay 1303 per month. That's 2200 more than I should be paying according to the program rules. That's one full paycheck for me. It leaves no room for utilities or food. Groceries for my family. I shouldn't have to pay it, but I do. And Housing Authority won't fix it. No one should have to make a decision between groceries and rent. I just moved in a couple months ago. I moved into a home that needed many repairs, and to this day, those repairs still haven't been done. Despite me asking, and I have this on email, asking them multiple times to, to fix it, and, and they haven't. When I moved in, the home hadn't been cleaned, and there weren't even light bulbs in every room. So I paid for all of that myself as well. 
Within a month of living here, I received an eviction notice just because of some miscommunication between my landlord and the rental assistance program, which happens a lot. Tenants like me, mothers like me, families like mine are suffering every day because we do not have enough protections for renters. We need a tenant's bill of rights. We need even more than that. But that's at least a start. Thank you. Thank you. Lola Cox. Welcome. Hello, my name is Lola Cox and I am a renter in District 3. Today I am here in support of the Kentucky tenants in support of the Lexington Tenant Bill of Rights. As a student and young adult very new to renting, I'm appalled at what my peers in this city have let become the norm. Last year, I rented a house in Chevy Chase with three roommates. The rent was lower than the surrounding areas, so many of my expectations weren't high, but the landlord's attitude and the house itself was absolutely unacceptable. unacceptable. Disregarding the black mold and lead pipes that were present the entire time I lived there, on repeated occasion, our dishwasher and the washer broke, each with weeks long waits on the repair. At one point, we had a complication with the gas bill under our landlord's name, which left us with no heat for a week during winter. That same landlord said to my roommate, I only rent to college students because they don't complain. Impassioned by these experiences, um, this semester, I wrote my English final on the Lexington Tenants' Bill of Rights, and I would like to read you a short excerpt. <clears throat> Throughout our city and cities all over America, renters are discriminated against for their race, source of income, criminal history, eviction history, and immigration status. As reported by the Lexington Fair Housing Coalition's 2017 Housing Instability Report, low-income and black Latinx neighborhoods are evicted over twice the average rate of Lexingtonians, while tenants in predominantly white neighborhoods are evicted at one-sixth as often. That's under one-twelfth the rate of the black and Latinx communities. According to a national study by the Eviction Lab, one in every five adult renters in their sample was black, yet one in every three eviction filings were served to black renters. By passing the Lexington Tenants Bill of Rights, you, the city council, will be helping thousands of people like me and thousands of people in those communities keep their homes safe and affordable. Housing is a human right. Thank you. Thank you very much. James Woodhead, welcome. James Woodhead, I'm in the 10th District. Last Thursday, I commented that the safest communities have the most resources, not the most law enforcement officers with the shiniest tools. It's no coincidence that Lexington has recently ranked number one in the country for tenants struggling with increased rent, and the homicide rec record has been shattered despite record investments in policing. This includes the brand new seven-figure MOA that nearly every council member approved last week between LPCG and the FOP, $26 million that is hoped hoped to help officer retention. We seemingly never learn and continue to overinvest our resources on systems of harm at the expense of life-affirming city services. Now we are on the verge of prematurely ending the free pilot program with flock safety and moving forward with 100 surveillance cameras that will result in a quarter of a million dollars per year of local public money to one of the fastest growing tech companies in North America. To do so is investing taxpayers' money in a racket. Beyond offering the free pilot program, the Flock Sales team also recruits individuals with $250 Visa gift cards if they successfully re refer new communities to their business. Knowing that communities will be resistant to surveillance and risking privacy, Flock also has a program for a PR campaign. To counter negative feedback from concerned constituents, including groups like LPD Accountability and the ACLU of Kentucky, Flock conveniently offers webinars for getting community buy-in and securing funding or public tax money from city councils. Instead of investing in out-of-town multi-billion dollar tech companies that increase surveillance, we should be supporting our friends, families, and neighbors. 
Rather than overinvesting in punitive systems such as those that violently enforce evictions, perhaps we should recognize that one of the most significant resources needed for safe and healthy communities is the right to housing. Yet over half the people who work in Lexington no longer live in the city, largely due to the affordable housing crisis. This includes many of the LFUCG employees who spoke to us and in front of city council last week. Rent for tenants in my zip code alone has increased over 30% over the past six months, meaning that if my family had to move, we'd be priced out of our neighborhood. I'm sure many of you have had conversations with your constituents that are struggling to stay housed. Based on my experience, I'm assuming some of you had these conversations while knocking on doors, asking for votes during your election campaigns. Despite Lexington currently having millions of dollars in housing stabilization funds from the federal government, many of the tenants I've talked to have forcible detainer warrants on their doors and landlords that refuse to accept public funds. All too often, these landlords have also misinformed tenants about eviction court, leaving individuals and families with limited capacities to navigate a complicated system. Or perhaps you talk to tenants who aren't yet facing eviction, but have mold throughout their apartment, holes in the floor, and are afraid to ask for repairs while living in fear because rent for the neighboring unit just increased by $400. Excuse me, your time has expired. May I have one minute to finish, please? All right, all those in favor say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? All right, you have one minute. Thank you. As the housing supplies continue to decrease in Lexington over the past year, housing costs have continued to increase. Both tenants and public safety continue to be on the losing end of this equation. Rather than continue to apply a Band-Aid approach, such as surveillance cameras, a healthy community requires that we get to the root of the malady. Council has the opportunity to progressively move Lexington forward by implementing a Tenants' Bill of Rights that prevents evictions, fights housing discrimination, provides representation for those impacted, and creates accountability and transparency for landlords that are profiting from tenants. No to controversial flock surveillance cameras that increase profits for out-of-town investors with deep pockets. Yes to a Tenants' Bill of Rights that benefits Lexington's residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leanne Woodhead. Welcome. Leanne Woodhead, District 10. Um, I'm here tonight to ask all of you to vote no on the expansion of the flock program. This will cost a quarter of a million dollars annually. There has been no data to show that these flock cameras are reducing crime in the areas they are placed, which by the way are primarily black and brown low income areas throughout Lexington. Um, I am, instead, I am asking that you work towards investing in our community and systems that work to reduce harm to other, um, to those, to reduce harm to those that are working lower class families. Um, a quarter of a million dollars can fund a data back program, GVI. Folks in Lexington have been asking for this. GVI has shown to reduce crime across six other cities with the data. A quarter of a million dollars could create affordable housing and housing security for so many Lexington families that are currently struggling to keep a roof over their heads. A quarter of a million dollars could be used to provide domestic violence intervention and prevention services to those that need them. Again, a quarter of a million dollars could be used to provide more shelter for our ever-growing unhoused population here in Lexington. If you want to invest a quarter of a million dollars, please think about investing it into systems that do not inflict harm upon others in our community. I encourage you to wait on expanding this program and please pass a tenant's bill of rights. Thank you. Thank you, Dottie Bean. Welcome. Donnie Bean with Council District 8. <clears throat> For 36 years, this community has grappled with the problem of homelessness and millions of dollars have been spent addressing the issue and very little has been spent addressing the problem. We recently reviewed the 2022 Consolidated Plan Grants um, proposal submitted to the federal government for housing assistance, and we now understand why this problem has not gotten any better. 
<clears throat> the money that would, could, could have been spent in its entirety to help people instead has <clears throat> funded many social service agency jobs, programs that were poorly thought out and were heavy in administrative costs and light on money to help with rent, deposits, utilities, housing repairs, emergency help to keep people in their homes, and infrastructure improvements to low-income neighborhoods. We have a new council coming into office next month and a great opportunity to end this cycle of high taxation and poor management of government. We want to challenge incumbent councilmen and newcomers to examine the need for every dollar this government spends and not let its bureaucracy stand in the way of fiscal responsibility. The housing issues are <clears throat> just one part of a complex web of waste that is killing the motivation for young people to work and pay taxes. We suggest you read every word of every resolution and ask for a complete accounting of money spent and then ask yourself if you and the taxpayer are getting your money's worth and if each expenditure is really needed. Thank you. Lucas Bullock. <clears throat> Welcome. I'm Lucas Bullock, I live in District 3. So thank you to the council for allowing me to speak. My name is Lucas Bullock and I've grown up in Lexington for much, and lived in Lexington for much of my life. I went to Henry Clay High School and the University of Kentucky where I currently work as a graduate instructor. I'm here today with Kentucky Tenants to express my support for a Tenants Bill of Rights. I am currently a renter in the third district, and in the past I have rented in districts five and 10. While I love Lexington, some of the toughest moments of my life have been experienced as a renter in this city. One such moment came in 2016, when the home I was renting lost heating in November, and the landlord refused to, to fix the issue until January, despite me having paid rent on time. During that two month period, there were several days below freezing, and I remember sitting in my room bundled up, trying to study for my finals and not being able to think straight due to how cold it was. I used to blame myself for getting into a situation like that. But as it turned out, this landlord had a reputation for not fixing issues in a timely manner. And I only found out about this after I had ended my lease with him. For this reason, I support the implementation of a rental rent registry, one of the components of the Tenants' Bill of Rights, which will provide more transparency and information to renters about the rental properties and the landlords who manage them. If I had had access to a rental registry when I was trying to find housing back in 2016, I would have been able to make a more informed decision about who I rented from and potentially avoid living through the winter with no heat. I also support the Tenants' Bill of Rights due to my role as an educator. Each semester, I have a few students who approach me with concerns about their housing. Over the years, I've heard several horror stories from students who have rented homes containing lead paint, black mold, and leaky roofs, just to name a few examples from this semester. A tenant's bill of rights would provide transparency and information to young people who are often exploited by landlords when they are trying to find off-campus housing. Beyond these examples, each of the four components in the Tenants' Bill of Rights is necessary to improve the ability for everyone in Lexington to find safe, sustainable, and affordable housing. I want to emphasize to the council that this proposed legislation has not emerged from a vacuum. Rather, it has emerged from the perspectives of thousands of tenants in Lexington across all districts who are fed up with significant hurdles and issues associated with trying to put a roof over their heads. We need bold leadership to deliver this long overdue legislation, and I, alongside Kentucky tenants, will keep fighting until all renters can live affordably and comfortably in Lexington. We need a Tenants' Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you. Jess Bowman, welcome. Jess Bowman, District 9. As CM said recently, no one can deny in this recent election a major issue on voters' minds was public safety and crime, justifying expanding the flock cam program before the end of the pilot. 
But what the public has stated time and time again is they want crime reduced, and LPD has admitted multiple times they can't prove the cameras reduce crime. They actually don't even have any comparison data to show if this invasive surveillance system solves more crimes. We see the dollar amounts of stolen property recovered, but was that more or less than previously? We don't know. No data. As stated in LPD's own presentation, flock cams take pictures of the back of the vehicle, not just the license plate. An example was given, if someone sees a red Ford at a crime scene that didn't catch a plate number, the cameras will flag every red Ford, every single one. Does every red Ford get stopped by police? We don't know, no data. CM James Brown asked if there is data on the race or other demographics of people pulled over using the cameras. He's told that's not tracked, no data. Chief has stated there is misinformation, but we are referencing LPDs and the mayor's information, so why were they misinforming us? There's definitely plenty of misinformation about us and why we speak out in opposition, that we don't care as much about crime, that we support criminals and violence by asking for database solutions, transparency and accountability. Nothing could be further from the truth. Crime is real. Lack of true oversight of policing in Lexington is real. Two things can be true at the same time. $26 million raises for police and expensive invasive tools won't solve crime. We love our community and want our neighbors safe from harm. We want investment into the people. We want solutions that get to the root cause of crime, not just reactionary measures that create more harm. We want a tenant's bill of rights and a ban on income-based discrimination in housing. We want all our city workers who want to live in Lexington to be able to afford it. So yes, while it's true, crime was a hot button topic this past election, the voters of Lexington rejected most of the FOP endorsed candidates, instead choosing to vote in the most diverse council we've ever seen. We voted in council members who share our concerns about the efficacy of this quarter of a million dollar program. Given that, how can we not question the timing of a request for an expedited expansion, the request coming from Chief just three days after the election of six new council members? This timing appears to be an attempt to bypass what we actually voted for, ignores transparency, disregards the need for evidence-based solutions, and uses a lame duck council to trample the process. It's everything voters distrust about government. Thank you. Nick Lyle. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Nick Lyle, District 5. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share my perspective on why the Tenants' Bill of Rights is so important to our city. I moved to Lexington where my wife grew up and her family still lives a year and a half ago. In that time, I lived with generous in-laws, rented near the distillery district, and recently was able to purchase a home near Henry Clay High School in District 5. I'm speaking to support the Tenants' Bill of Rights for Lexington um, because housing insecurity hurts us all. I moved to Lexington because it seemed like a great place to live and have discovered many more reasons to love it since then. But I also moved here because I couldn't afford to live in Oakland, California anymore. I've seen what skyrocketing rents does to a city and the damage it does to its culture. Even in my short time here, I've seen the rent skyrocket and talked to numerous people who have to, had to leave their homes in Lexington because of the prices. I may now own my home, but that shouldn't be the only way to secure a long-term, stable place to live and grow a family. I want to know that my neighbors feel safe and can commit to the long-term building of deep community here in Lexington that makes any place thrive. Rapidly rising rents, landlord discrimination, and evictions are a splinter in this community. Please ensure prompt passage of all the components of the Tenants' Bill of Rights. These are really the most basic protections and should not require much debate. I'm only surprised they don't exist yet. Imagine if lobbyists, for example, uh, for building contractors push back against smoke alarm requirements, the council would still support basic fire code to prevent our city from burning down, no matter the imaginary lobbyists' false and exaggerated protests. That it would mean uh, no one would build anymore, or that the smoke alarms would actually, through some contrivance, actually hurt the people in burning buildings. I'm asking you to prioritize our community, our workers and residents over the profits landlords get from their most horrible practices, only to squeeze a few extra dollars of rent. Certainly doing nothing in the face of the issues we're facing is the worst option. Um, I have actually been a landlord for a short period of time, and I sincerely hope no one on this council is so naive as to listen to the landlord uh, here, landlords here uncritically. Uh, none of these protections will put any uh, rental housing providers out of business. 
unless their business is discriminating against and evicting Lexington residents. These, are, these new regulations should include um, uh, all the things mentioned. I don't think I need to go into them again. Thank you. Thank you oh, very and much. And also, I uh, don't support the uh, expansion of the flock surveillance program. Thank you. Dave Collins. Welcome. My name is Dave Collins. I reside in the 9th District. I'm a detective with the Flexington Police Department, and I utilize the flock system, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the flock system and why we do need additional cameras. This has been a tremendous benefit for our department and our city. Um, there are weekly success stories from many different detectives and many different units within the police department that have utilized the flock system to further investigations and close cases. They have been invaluable in helping constituents, many constituents of your all's constituents in each of your districts. The recovery rate of stolen vehicles has increased. It was pretty high when compared to the national average anyway, but it's helped that rate go up. It has led to an increase in criminal actors being apprehended in a shorter amount of time. It's used simply as a tool to further investigations. It does, I've heard some of the other comments, it does take photos of the rear of the car. The system focuses on vehicles, not people. It will take pictures of license plates. It does take pictures of the back of cars, so if we don't have a license plate, we can enter different parameters. But that is useful in that if there is a red Jeep that is a suspect vehicle in a crime somewhere, then if there's something specific about the suspect's vehicle in question, whether it's a dented bumper or a rust spot on the hood, we can look in the flock system for those specific traits of that specific vehicle so we're not out stopping every red Jeep we see in the area that this crime occurred. So basically it can be used as exculpatory evidence as well as inculpatory to show potential guilt of someone in the vehicle, if it's a stolen vehicle, if it was involved in robberies, rapes, murders, more cameras. I mean, we have the 25 right now. If we get the additional 75, it would be a great help to our department. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for supporting the Lexington Police Department. Myself, my fellow officers, uh, definitely appreciate the uh, support that you all give us during these meetings. And I did have one more thing to add. Uh, a lot of things I'm hearing this evening involve people being concerned about over surveillance, too much surveillance. Many of those people are the people that demanded that the police officers wear body worn cameras, but they say that these flock cameras are going too far. I'm for, may I have one more minute, ma'am? Uh, I don't more, even need a full minute. One more minute, is there a motion? <laughs> all right, all those in favor say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? You have another minute. Okay, won't even take the full minute. Thank you though. Um, but I'll say that Yes, the body-worn cameras I think are super important. I'm glad we have them because it shows the tremendous work that our officers and detectives do on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. And in the event one of us makes a mistake, that's there too. I love the accountability of having this on me. I just find it a little ironic that some people are saying that the flock cameras are too much surveillance but every police officer in Lexington wears a camera for every encounter and it's recording. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Joe Holland. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Holland. I'm a detective with the Lexington Police Auto Crimes Unit. I've been with this unit since 2015. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the effectiveness of the flock system. Um, we have noticed, it, like Detective Collins said, we already had a fairly high clearance rate or recovery of stolen vehicles. However, with 
with this system, our recovery rate is exponentially higher, which is good with the decreased number of detectives and patrolmen we have on the street. We're able to focus on a specific area instead of a broad search of vehicles uh, or area. Um, I have worked several cases where the system has been very beneficial. Um, I can't provide direct insight of these cases because they're still not adjudicated, but I'll give a brief overview. Um, the system has been successful in helping with an, a homicide investigation based on um, photos from the scene from uh, a business. I was able to help homicide detectives get the vehicle in question, which was a stolen vehicle using the LPR system. Um, I've used it to investigate cargo thefts. I've used it to investigate, obviously, stolen cars. Um, I spoke with detectives in the financial crimes unit, and they've used it on numerous occasions when it comes to bank fraud and other uh, money schemes. Um, and there was a concern mentioned earlier about other agencies sharing data and so forth. Um, just last week, I was contacted by a sergeant in Alabama um, who had arrested a criminal syndicate, and through the Fox, the Flock system, he was able to ascertain that they had been in Lexington. And due to this information, an investigation has been ongoing, and there was several thousands of dollars worth of jewelry that was stolen from multiple businesses here in Lexington. Um, so, without the Flock system, that information probably never would have came to fruition. Um, Furthermore, the system does not gather information on driver demographics, only the registration plate, time, and location of where the vehicle crossed the system. This is less invasive and intrusive than the Riverlink system in Louisville when you cross the bridge that collects all that data and then sends you a bill. So I, I cede the rest of my time to Jeremy Day. To whom? Jeremy Day, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Dan Pack. Thanks. Um, Welcome. <clears throat> Daniel Pack, First District. Um, I am a scientist and an engineer. I've spent 30 years of my life uh, designing experiments and analyzing data and reaching conclusions. And so I'd like to <clears throat> share a little bit of my perspective on the flock cameras um, based on that experience. Um, the first thing which is not in dispute is that the data that we have are incomplete. The flock safety recommended a one-year trial uh, pilot period, and that's because that's how long it takes to gather a good data set. Um, we know that we're cutting, talking about cutting that short, um, and we can't, even, even if we agree that the preliminary data we have show that the cameras are working, we can't know that they're going to continue to work. We can't know that we're not going to discover some downsides or some problems um, that could crop up. We just don't know because we haven't taken the time to gather all the data. The second thing that's been pointed out before is that we don't have the proper controls. In other words, we've been given numbers on uh, vehicles recovered or subpoenas and warrants issued. But those numbers are meaningless unless we also are told um, for example, <clears throat> how many cars would have been recovered, how many vehicles would have been recovered in a similar period of time without the flock cameras, how many subpoenas, how many of those subpoenas would have been issued anyway, even if the person hadn't happened to have driven by one of those cameras. And the third thing is, we're now talking about changing the experimental conditions. The decision was made back in the spring uh, that we would not be told, or that the, the locations of the cameras would not be publicized. Good decision, bad decision, I don't know. But now we're being told that the conditions, that the locations will be publicized. So now that we're changing the parameters of the experiment, the only thing, we, we have no data to indicate whether the cameras work or don't work when the locations are publicized. So the only thing that we can do is throw out the data and start the pilot over again. We cannot cut the, the pilot short. The bottom line is really this. If one of my undergraduate students presented me with an incomplete data set peppered by, um, peppered by statistically meaningless, inherently biased anecdotes from non-experts um, and uh, extrapolated their conclusions to uh, a situation completely different than that under which the experiments were conducted, I would absolutely, without a doubt, fail that student. Um, 
So there's, there's just no legitimate, scientifically justified, data-driven uh, rationale for concluding that these cameras are a good investment. If there's some other reason for spending the money in this way at this time, then so be it. Just say so. But don't tell me and don't tell my community that your decision is based on the data because it is not. Thank you. Norm Biller. Okay. He spoke earlier. Yes, thank you. Um, Adrian Williams. Welcome. Hi, my name is Adrienne Williams and I'm an organizer with Kentucky Tenants. I rent in the third district and I support a tenant's bill of rights. In particular, I wanna talk about a long-term landlord registry. I care about a long-term long landlord registry because Lexington is a horse town, but it's also a college town. I'm a faculty member at UK and I know firsthand that there are students, campus employees, and plenty of other people who move to Lexington without knowing much, if anything, about the rental landscape they'll be moving into. Right now, information about slumlords and other disreputable landlords is spread through word of mouth and other myriad sources. Many of the largest rental companies go one step further and incentivize new renters at their properties to leave positive reviews by offering temporary rent or fee deductions or other bonuses. It's unnecessarily difficult for tenants to gather all of the information they need to make an informed decision on where to rent. Tenants should be able to go to one source and look up unbiased information about a landlord's property management history just as easily as landlords are able to do background checks on prospective renters. A long-term rental registry with publicly accessible information on evictions, code enforcement violations, and tenant compla complaints would help not only students, but plenty of other people in this city. It would give us a better sense of what we're getting into before renting from certain landlords. It would also help the city keep landlords accountable for their actions and the consequences of those actions on current and future renters. The people of the city deserve a robust, well-enforced, long-term landlord registry, and we deserve a tenant's bill of rights as well. I also wanna talk about the imminent vote for the Flock License Plate Renter Reader Program. I believe that a council vote on this pilot program should wait until after the pilot has finished next year after council and the citizens of Lexington have had an opportunity to review more comprehensive data of how this program has worked. As it stands, there are concerns that black and African American communities are being over surveilled by these cameras, with 20% of the flock cameras being allocated in black neighborhoods, despite black and African American people being 15% of the Fayette County population. It's clear that more research is needed on how flock safety and, and LPD can mitigate the equity issues that are already present in this program. Council needs to give this pilot pro program the time it needs to work out issues before it is scaled up. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Amber Coughlin. Amber. Michelle Ballard. Michelle Ballard. James Wilcox. I do not have a Leslie, I don't think, signed up. Oh, well, okay, uh, we'll get to you then. We, I have three more pages up here, so if you will, um, okay, uh, James Wilcox, you ceded your time to Leslie, who's on the next page, so we'll get to that. April Taylor, welcome. Welcome. Um, April Taylor, First District. Um, I, I'm just going to read some things that you all could read in your email. Um, I'm not very encouraged that all of you do, so that's why I'm going to repeat some of it. 
Um, homelessness is not a disease or an affliction. It's an inability to pay rent or make the mortgage. There are many uncontrollable reasons why that happens. Um, and while there are many uncontrollable reasons people become homeless, discrimination based on source of income is controllable, and you all can prevent that. Um, you all, as the council, need to pass a ban on discrimination based on source of income, criminal history, credit score, eviction history, and immigration status. A common cause of homelessness is landlords refusing to accept applications from people using Section 8 or homelessness assistance programs or people with criminal histories, low credit scores, eviction histories, or no social security number. Often these tenants have the money to pay the rent, but they cannot find a place that will accept their application. Um, Louisville passed an anti-discrimination ordinance in December of 2020. I also know what it's like to have the money to pay for an entire year's rent and spend more than six months trying to beg somebody to take that money from me. Um, so this is not always, this is not always an issue of whether or not somebody has the money or needs um, um, a voucher to help cover it. There are also people who have the money without the voucher system and just cannot find people who will take their voucher. Um, in the 11 states and over 50 cities and counties that have passed bans on source of income discrimination, they have been shown to substantially improve the ability of people using third party payments to access housing. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, public housing agencies and jurisdictions with laws banning source of income discrimination had voucher utilization rates five to 12 percentage points higher. And as Emma mentioned earlier, in a city that has 10,000 vouchers, this translates to 500 to 1,200 families being able to use their vouchers, so hundreds of families being able to find housing. Um, this means that if the city passed a ban on source of income discrimination, our city's homelessness prevention programs would work more effectively. We would be able to serve more households more quickly with the same amount of money. According to a 2018 study in cities without source of income discrimination protections, 77% of landlords reject applications using vouchers, whereas in cities with bans on source of income discrimination, that number drops to only 35%. Um, and I do want to pivot here really quick to tell you that I think it's completely asinine that you force through a policy regarding the flock cameras when the probationary period to gather data has not expired. You know that, that voters here in Lexington chose to elect the most diverse and progressive city council in Lexington history, and you are trying to circumvent that democratic right that we have to be represented by the people that we elect by trying to force through legislation prior to the um, program to test for data even being halfway expired. It's only been three months. Don't circumvent our democracy and our voice. Thank you. Next is Quinn Mulholland, and I believe, are you donating your time? Okay, thank you. Tana Fogel, and you'll have your three minutes plus Quinn Mulholland's three minutes. Welcome. Tana Fogel, First District, James Brown. Um, I actually showed up here tonight on behalf of Kentuckians for the Commonwealth to acknowledge Frederick Douglass as the state champions. And I really wanted to go after the mayor had that wonderful presentation. And then I said, well, I'll just do this at another time. However, um, in my 62 years, I've watched um, Charlotte Court disappear, East End Projects disappear, South End, Davis Bottom disappear, you know, roots of folks here in Lexington. And um, as I represent the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth tonight, I just wanted you all to know that our 42-year organization stands in solidarity with the Tenants Bill of Rights and that's all I have to say. I know y'all surprised, but uh, Merry Christmas. That's it. Thank you. Um, several council members have asked to take a five minute break. Do you want to do that or do you want to keep going? All right, do you want to express that? All right, I have several. We'll go on a five-minute recess, so if you'll be back here at 
eight, please. Then we have several more speakers. Public comment. Next is Catherine Smith. Welcome. Hey, you all. My name is Catherine Smith. Um, I'm from Lexington, and I rent in District 1. I've also rented in District 3 and 5 over the past eight years, and I've always paid my rent on time. Since I've been renting in Lexington starting in 2014, I've had issues with almost every landlord that I've had. I've dealt with mold. I had an oven filled with mouse poop posing health hazard and leaving us without an oven to cook with. And I had to re remove multiple raccoons myself because a landlord didn't want to deal with it. My current landlord is the worst I've ever had, being incredibly unresponsive to his tenants and showing a general lack of concern or respect for us. Both me and his other tenants, um, or for both me and his other tenants, he is oftentimes unwilling to fix very reasonable requests, such as a dangerous broken fence, a dishwasher that pretty much has not worked the whole time that we've been there, a mold concern, or being reluctant to fix old broken blinds because it's expensive to fix, when really that's his legal responsibility. He oftentimes takes months to fix problems when he does comply, is incredibly invasive, showing up unannounced, entering our apartment without us opening the door for him, and is incredibly unprofessional in how he communicates with us. Both me and my roommate generally don't feel safe leaving the house at the same time if we know he is around because there is no level of trust there. And despite the things that I've had to deal with, this is still by far not the worst that tenants have to face, as many people in Lexington deal with much more severe scenarios and evictions, some of which we've heard today. And as we can see, there's an overwhelming amount of problems that renters have to face that could easily be mitigated with the Tenant Bill of Rights, which includes a landlord registry. With a landlord registry, people would be able to hear from previous tenant experiences and make an informed decision about what they can expect from a landlord, just as any other business has a review platform as well. With such a reasonable request, if landlords are providing safe housing situations as they claim they are and conduct themselves in a professional manner, they don't have anything to worry about. With how high rent is, many of us don't have a choice in where we can live having to deal with these subpar housing conditions because there is nowhere else to go. We shouldn't have to compromise on health and safety just to have a roof over our heads. A tenant bill of rights, including a landlord registry, is critical if we renters are having to put our well-being and our sense of safety of home in the hands of another. A Tenant Bill of Rights would help us enforce the already existing protections we have under state and federal laws that simply just aren't being enforced. Thank you. Your time is up. Can I just have like 20 more seconds to That's finish? up to the council. All those in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. Anyone opposed? All right, you have 20 seconds. Awesome. Thank you. We want to see our elected officials show up in action for the everyday people that are sitting across from you today and feeling the brunt of the housing crisis. We hope that as you wake up in your own home tomorrow morning, you think of the other people in this town who aren't waking up in the safe housing situations we all deserve. Safe and affordable housing is a human right, and I want Lexington to be a leader in providing this for the people who live here. Thank you for your time, and I also do not um, uh, agree with the expansion of the flat system. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Blake Standifer. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Blake Standifer. I uh, live in District 3, but uh, I've lived all over Lexington. Uh, I've been a tenant in Lexington uh, pretty much straight for the past uh, seven years. Um, and I just wanted to give my perspective on what it's like to be a, a, a young student tenant in Lexington. Um, really, 
I would say a lot of the landlords here would consider me a bad tenant because uh, I expect them to be able to compromise, I expect them to fix issues, and I expect them to communicate. Um, uh, property owners in uh, Lexington that I have worked with uh, are at best aloof and non-responsive, at worst uh, predatory. Um, just a, a few uh, examples, I've had a, a dispute with my, the housing company I was with and then uh, very soon uh, some unannounced renovations happened, all of my stuff covered in drywall, uh, I had to hear about my roommate complaining. I had a hole in my ceiling in another property for months. Uh, later that property uh, was found to have mold and roaches. It was horrible. Uh, my family was appalled at what uh, working seven days a week, including school, would get you in, in um, downtown Lexington or around campus. Um, I understand that this is really uh, a class issue. Uh, there are people who see these properties as uh, a good safe way to invest their money and uh, they want to see a return on that investment. For other people it's a, a place where they uh, live and it's um, the line between being out on the street and uh, having a place where they can live and work. Um, the people I know uh, and myself in a way um, they're uh, intimidated and, and scared of uh, their landlords. They, uh, they know they don't have any power, and the landlords know it too. They're usually completely unwilling to compromise, and uh, there's, you really just don't have a say. Um, I would like to see, uh, as an American, I'd like to see the more democratization of this uh, landlord-tenant relationship. Um, and if my little attempts at rhetoric hasn't changed your mind, I can quote the Founding Fathers, uh, life, liberty, and uh, property. And if we can't own property, I think we should at least have dignity uh, when we are renting. Um, thank you, I cede my time to the next person. Thank you very much. Matt Heil, welcome. Good evening, uh, my name is Matt Heil. I'm a homeowner in District 1, just the one home. Uh, and tonight I'm here with Kentucky Tenants to support the Tenants Bill of Rights. In 2006, I rented a house with a few other guys on University Avenue. And when one of them, the one who was our point of contact with the landlord, began stealing our rent checks, we got lucky that we were able to scrape together enough money from our part-time jobs to make up the difference we were even luckier that the landlord gave us enough time to do so because he was hounding and threatening us the entire time. From 2015 to 2021, my wife and I rented a house on Suburban Court. When I got laid off from my job in February 2016, I got lucky that that landlord gave me the time I needed to find a job and pay the back rent without throwing us out in the cold. When five raccoons moved into our attic in that house in 2021, it was the sheerest coincidence, the dumbest kind of luck, that I grew up helping run a trap line and hunting small game. So when the landlord told me the least backed up pest control service was still gonna take six weeks to get to us, it was just luck that I could deal with it when one of those raccoons would fall through the drop tile ceiling in the back room. Three of them did that. We were lucky that they didn't bite us or our cats and cause us bills that we could not then afford. We got lucky that we did not have to clean up that much raccoon excrement from our living space ourselves. When the tenant, with the tenant's bill of rights, which you can and must pass, you can take all of the luck out of keeping a roof over your and your family's heads. You can take the luck out of finding a humane, decent, accountable landlord. You can take the luck out of finding a livable, clean home that doesn't make you sick or get you bitten. You can take the luck out of finding a place you can actually afford and can continue to afford even when the worst happens. You can take the luck out of whether or not you become homeless because the market, a thing no renter controls, takes an unlucky turn. By passing the Tenant Bill of Rights, you will guarantee an improved quality of life for many thousands of Lexingtonians, most of whom cannot and probably would not catch the kind of breaks that I have. Do the right thing by everybody and not just property owners and pass the Tenant Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you. John Winstead. 
Welcome. Hi, my name is John Winstead. Uh, I'm a graduate student at UK and a renter in District 1. I've lived in Lexington for about eight years. I'm here to express my support for the Tenants' Bill of Rights. When I moved to my most recent house uh, about two years ago, I had to go through a background check, a credit check, pay first and last month's rent, and put down a security deposit. From my experience, this is a pretty standard procedure for renting in most places. Despite meeting my obligations as a tenant, when I moved in in December, there was no hot water or heat. I found out after I moved in in that house that the house was renovated to remove the gas water heater and replace it with an electric one. It's fine. But the gas line to the old water heater was never sealed. So whenever the gas was turned on for heating, the entire house filled with gas. The gas company could only turn on the gas to provide me heating once somebody came and sealed the old line. Also, the new electric water heater was never properly installed. I mean, more accurately, it, it just wasn't installed. I'm not a plumber, so when I toured the unit, it was not immediately apparent to me that there were any issues. And one would assume that if a house is being listed, that all these renovations would have long since been taken care of. You know, one would assume that. For weeks, I was on the phone with the property management company, the utility companies, the contractors, that were supposed to come out and fix all of this, I had to be the middleman. The temperatures dropped below freezing every night, and during the day, I was lucky for it to break 50 degrees. I had to shower at my friends' houses. Luckily, I had enough friends. It was a miserable first month, and I had done everything as my part as a tenant. I, I did that. During it all, I had to be the middleman to coordinate the fixes while also going to school and working a job. The fact that this unit could even be placed on the rental market before it was, in, before it was livable is unconscionable. It was lucky in a weird way that I was the one duped into this situation and not a family. If a rental registry existed, such as the one proposed by the Tenants' Bill of Rights, I would have had actual recourse to fix these issues, or at least known to look for another house rather than commit to living in an inhospitable housing situation for a month. I often hear that we should be grateful for landlords that are willing to provide housing for me, but my, man, but my landlord did not provide a ha habitable living space until I made it clear that this space was illegal. If anything, since my rent is just over the amount of the mortgage for that house, it is much more accurate to say that I am providing him housing, and all I want is the rights that come with that responsibility. The City of Lexington needs a Tenants' Bill of Rights yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Milton? Milto? Welcome. Hi, my name is Rebecca Milto. I'm a homeowner in the 5th District, and I'm here in support of the Tenants' Bill of Rights. I've lived in Lexington for about eight years and was a renter for six. Affording a place to live is tough these days, and even harder for those whose lives have been upended by domestic violence. I'm a Master of Social Work student at UK, and my eyes were open to this when I was interning at uh, Kentucky Refugee Ministries as a victim advocate. There I was helping immigrants and refugees that were victims of domestic violence. One of the most important ways that we ensure women and children are safe is by stabilizing their housing. So while I needed to help clients prepare their cases for court, I actually found most of my time was eaten up trying to help them find a safe place to live, safe affordable housing, because there barely is any in Lexington. Uh, what small amount I could find available was poorly maintained and safety not guaranteed. And even those units get snatched up pretty quickly. Some of the most challenging cases I had were clients being evicted because they couldn't make rent while their husband was in jail for abuse, or some clients' documentation was out of date while they waited for their asylum to be granted. When I spoke to landlords all over Lexington explaining the situations of these women who were fleeing the violence of their husbands, many of them told me they aren't allowed to make special consideration because of fair housing except these same landlords are allowed to discriminate on the basis of immigration status, credit score, and income by charging $1,000 for rent and requiring tenants to earn two or three times that. 
My experience at KRM showed me firsthand how difficult finding and maintaining housing is <clears throat> when your life is destabilized by domestic violence. <clears throat> Understand the landlord's perspective that having lots of competition for units forces them to be choosy. So we have to increase the stock of affordable housing in Lexington. But that takes time, and what we can do now is protect Lexington renters by adopting a tenant's bill of rights. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Amy Clark. Amy Clark. Okay. Emily Jackson. Welcome. My name is Emily Jackson. I'm a renter in District 3. I'm here today with Kentucky Tenants to express my support for the Tenants' Bill of Rights. We've heard some stories tonight from renters here in Lexington about the devastating impact of eviction, housing insecurity, and lack of affordable housing. And we know that there are many thousands more renters in our city who are struggling right now to find affordable housing or to keep a roof over their heads. So I'll keep this short. I'm here today to speak because I strongly believe that a tenant's bill of rights will make our communities stronger, healthier, safer places to live. And I'd like to cede the remainder of my time to Nolan Adams. Thank you. Casey Lyons. Welcome. My name is Casey Lyons. I'm a renter in District 5 currently. I'm, the majority of the time I've lived in Lexington, I rented in District 3. Uh, I'm currently employed as a crime victims advocate at Lexington Pride Center. I am an on-call crisis responder with Ampersand Sexual Violence Resource Center. And I'm also a member of the Access Healing Council, which is an, a statewide initiative by the Kentucky Association of Sexual Assault Programs to increase um, and improve rape crisis centers services in marginalized communities. So you might say that working with crime victims is my life work, my life's work. And I'm not here to ask for more policing and surveillance. That's not what most crime victims want in my experience. They do ask for systems to do more, but it matters what the more is. The more that I hear them asking me for more than anything else is housing assistance. Many victims are homeless, at risk of becoming homeless, or they need to move to a safer place. You don't live long on the street without experiencing a crime. And crimes like intimate partner violence and human trafficking can put you on the street if you weren't there already. It's a vicious cycle, because being on the street also puts you at the mercy of traffickers and abusers who can promise you a bed tonight and start hurting you tomorrow knowing that you'll be too afraid to report them to anyone and lose the only place you have to stay. Crime victims trying to get out of that cycle have the same roadblocks as other renters. Voucher programs with three-year waiting lists, and even when you get a voucher, no one takes it. Many victims are labeled as criminals themselves based on things they have to do to survive. Fighting back when they're attacked, self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, because they can't afford or have been traumatized by formal health care, turning to survival sex work, theft, and selling drugs for the money they need to eat, or even something as small as sleeping or panhandling somewhere they're not supposed to. The jail is full of people whose only crime is being homeless. The jail and the streets are both full of people with untreated health issues, physical health, mental health, and that includes addiction. Housing is health care. All the time I see people who can't take care of their health without housing. They have no bathroom, no way to restore their med medications. The medications get lost or they freeze in the cold. No consistent place to charge their phone, which is their only calendar and alarm clock for getting to appointments. And homelessness is terrible for a person's sobriety, mental health, and even suicidality. Housing is health care and housing is a crime reduction strategy. Data shows that investing in affordable housing specifically and health care more broadly reduce crime. For example, your time is up. May I have one more minute to close? 
All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? You have one minute. Thank you. For example, when the Affordable Health Care Act passed and states could choose to participate in the expansion of Medicaid or opt out, the states that expanded Medicaid had a sustained drop in crime that didn't happen to the states that opted out. I've already emailed you all a study that shows for every dollar spent on health care, education, or affordable housing, crime goes down. And for every dollar spent on policing, crime goes up. The numbers are clear. If the goal is to reduce crime, meeting basic needs is the way to do that. When people are healthy and their needs are met, they don't get desperate. The jail is full of people who are desperate to survive, and meeting people's needs in the first place prevents that crime. It doesn't just make that person safer, it makes everyone else around them safer. They can, uh, they can take care of those health issues that make people erratic and unstable, get sober, stay on their meds, make their appointments. And I'm going to skip some things. My Thank minute. you. Your <laughs> time is up now. Thank you so much. Andrea Zhang, welcome. Hello, my name is Andrea Zhang, and I'm a runner in the third district. Um, when I first moved to Lexington two years ago, I served as an AmeriCorps VISTA. Vistas do not make a lot of money, so I picked up a second job at Kroger. I would bike from my Vista job to work a late shift at Kroger and then get home after 10 p.m. I experienced a year of being unable to afford rent, relying on a partner. It was a real struggle, and there are people in this community who have dealt with that all of their lives. As a child, my mother struggled to afford housing in a good school district. Um, I have a better job now, so affording rent has become easier, but our landlord raised our rent and now we need to move. Um, and as long as we can afford it, any landlord in town will probably take our money. But if we used a voucher or the city's rental assistance program, landlords would be able to discriminate against us just because of how we paid our rent. In Fayette County, 96.8% of voucher holding households are headed by women, and 81.1% of those households are headed by black women. That's from a HUD study that our housing authority participated in. Those, that's who landlords are asking to be able to continue discriminating against, and that's not right. People shouldn't end up homeless because landlords don't want to do some extra paperwork or participate in inspections to make sure that a unit is safe. There is no comparison between the two. Lexington needs a ban on source of income discrimination, and it needs a full tenant's bill of rights so that tenants are protected. Um, and we also need our council to do its due diligence and allow the flock program, pilot program, to continue before making a decision on if we should keep spending money on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dennis Cheney, welcome. Hello, my name is Dennis Cheney. I'm a homeowner in the 5th District. Um, I came here today to speak on the Tenant Bill of Rights. Uh, I moved to Lexington in 2015 and was a renter for uh, six years. Um, what I noticed the most about renting here was the, the power imbalance uh, between the, the, the renter and the uh, landlord. Um, if, you, you know, was a, if you were a bad tenant who needed repairs done, you constantly had to weigh the options can I afford to, you know, upset this uh, tent this landlord who may uh, refuse to, you know, renew my lease? Um, the tenant bill of rights will, you know, help improve that power imbalance. Um, back in October of 2021 in Akron, Ohio, um, one woman died. Eight, ten people were hospitalized because um, they had a carbon monoxide leak there. Uh, Ohio did have a carbon monoxide detector law but they had no inspections, no way to ensure compliance with that law. Uh, with, the, with the landlord uh, registry, you would be able to you know, make sure these, uh, these apartments are safe and uh, inspected. Um, you know, people who end up suffering these consequences um, are often the most uh, powerful, powerless. And, um, And then the other issue I wanted to talk about today was the uh, Jefferson Street Aqueduct Project um, with the uh, Main Street Baptist Church. Uh, I understand that the delicate, you know, historical 
uh, considerations of this church and their needs. Um, but I have to think that, you know, spending $6.5 million on a ramp to High Street uh, and then another million dollars for a parking lot on Jefferson Street uh, for a church to have adequate parking for their Sunday services seems like a bridge too far. Uh, I feel like for $7.5 million, some better compromise could be reached um, offering them Ubers. I mean, that's decades of Uber rides. Um, buying a, a lot nearby to provide um, parking, uh, there just seems to be, a, there must be a better way to spend this money and, and find a solution there. I just hope that uh, you vote no on that million dollar allocation and, and continue negotiations to make sure uh, both sides can have an equitable agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nolan Adams, and you welcome. You have your three minutes and two minutes from Emily Jackson. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Nolan Adams of uh, District 8. I'm a leader with KY Tenants, and I stand with my fellow leaders here tonight. There are people, these are people who I consider my friends and family, and I see them struggle every day with many things, and most of the time, that struggle is trying to keep a roof over their head. I'm here with my fellow tenants and citizens of Lexington to vocalize my support for the Tim's Bill of Rights and defend it from dog whistles like they're turning Lexington into Louisville. In reality, we want to be better than Louisville at ensuring residents have safe, affordable housing. Because having stable housing puts people on a path toward being an engaged citizen in our community and our economy. Like many cities across the country, ours is in crisis. As rent has risen more in our city than, the other top, than any of the other top 50 largest cities in the country, and thousands are left insecure with their housing. As rent and inflation go up and wages remain stagnant, the people are left without the ability to participate in the economy, which hurts everyone from the very top to the very bottom. Without consumers with buying power, there are less customers for the business owners. It means less people will decide that Lexington is affordable for them uh, to stay here and try to become a tenant in the first place. A ban on source of income discrimination would create an economy in, Lex in Lexington that ha would have legitimate upward mobility. By increasing the ability for those who use subsidized housing in Lexington to have access to safe and high quality homes, you increase their chances of upward mobility and create a Lexington where all people can succeed regardless of their life circumstances, regardless of their eviction history, their criminal history, or their immigration status, people deserve to have their basic needs met. Denying them housing does nothing but put them in a situation where upward, upward mobility is near impossible. We have talked to thousands of tenants across the city, and we know their struggle. We live their struggle. Thousands of people whose landlords have prioritized their source of passive income over their tenants living in housing that could be considered humane whose homes are filled with mold, filled with rodents, who, uh, with outdated appliances that don't work and don't see the maintenance they need. In my last living situation, we had a break-in occur that left our back window completely broken for two months while we searched for housing that fit all of our needs, leaving us feeling unsafe physically and unwell mentally as we continue to worry about break-ins because of the broken window. All of the proposed aspects of the Tenants' Bill of Rights are only designed to give tenants more representation and prevent inhumane treatment, like guaranteed seats for tenants in housing boards and commissions, right to an attorney in eviction court, and the landlord re registry. Excuse me. Uh, we need the Tenants' Bill of Rights because we, we all need a home, that is. Um, we just want to live in Lexington like everybody else, uh, but that is becoming harder every single day. Uh, but we need your help, council members, to get this passed, and we, gen and we genuinely look to you for that help, as we see that many of you want to do good for your community. As Ms. Joyce says, we are the bees. We do everything together, and we will be back. Thank you. And I'd also like to uh, uh, cede the rest of my time to uh, Bo Rivlet, please. Thank you. All right, next is Leslie, is it Way? And welcome. Um, you'll have your three minutes and three minutes from James Wilcox earlier. My name is Leslie Whaley. I live in District 4. We're all here for the same reason, every single one of us, because we care. 
We all want more safe, affordable, clean housing. We want to give it to you. That's what we want to do. You, our city council, you've got the key to the solutions. You can do this, and only you can unlock the door that's holding us all back. Will you help us, please? The pandemic did us all a nasty turn. When governments required property owners to foot the bill for thousands of stranded citizens, you really hurt the mom and pop landlords. So guess what? We had to sell. And when BlackRock came to town and offered 30 to 50% more for a property, who can resist that? So guess what? That is why rent went up. When that happened, the property appraiser raised the value on our houses. No matter if we didn't put in new granite, we didn't put in new tile, we didn't put on a fancy gazebo, we didn't do anything. But that increased the value of our homes, the value of our homes, which increased our taxes. And do you know what that does? That increases our insurance. And do you know what that does? That raises your rent. You guys can help us out. Can you make a 30-day moratorium on huge corporations buying single-family homes? Give families the chance to do what other communities do. Why can't we? You know what the reward was for those of us who were sticking around and not selling out? More taxes, more rules, more regulations. This tenant bill of rights is not going to lower rent and it's not going to create more fairness. It will only make offering affordable housing more difficult. Your solution creates more taxes and invites lawyers to fix things. Taxes and lawyers don't fix things, never. Like you say, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. I'm asking that you invite landlords to the table. There have been meetings and councils and things with only tenants. Allow us to come to the table. We have great ideas. Can you please incentivize people for um, building ADUs now? Cash, tax breaks, something. Let's get more homes on the market. If you're going to make rules about how property owners may use their property, make a rule that HOAs have to allow accessory units. Make rules that they have to build duplexes in neighborhoods. That leads to more home ownership. And that leads to more satisfaction in both the renter and the landlord side. When a landlord and a renter live close together, the rent gets paid, things get fixed, rents can stay lower, and it's usually no credit check. This is how we create more affordable housing. Adding rules, adding tax, adding legislation is not going to help the situation. Everyone here today agrees there's some really, really, really rotten landlords in Lexington. But we already have some things in place to take care of that. There's the housing coal Collective, the Tenant Review, Lexington Fair Housing, Human Rights Commission, and our friend, Code Enforcement. I called Code Enforcement to get some statistics, and they said they get calls all the time. But when they show up to take pictures, they're not allowed in. So they can't take the picture, and they can't send that rotten, horrible landlord that lets mold stay in an apartment they, they can do nothing about it. He doesn't, he doesn't get a warning. We have to use what we have in place. I highly encourage a registry of property owners that are derelict in performing required repairs or treating tenants unfairly. But I think it's only fair that there's a registry of tenants who do not pay rent and who damage property beyond normal wear and tear. I amount thousands and thousands of dollars fixing, fixing, and fixing. It's not fair to us. The credit check issues, I understand that, but many communities are adding something called um, 
rent insurance. It works like mortgage insurance. It's a policy, there's a payment, tenant can't pay, landlord gets paid. I say if we're gonna spend any tax money on something like this, it is the city pays the, the premium. Then they can get in, they can get a good record of being able to pay, everybody's happy. You've gotta treat us fairly as well. And I'd like to point out that allowing renters to not pay rent for months turned thousands of family rental units into short-term rentals. Thousands, let that sink in, in one year, thousands went. Because you can kick them out and they'll pay the rent. Please, please don't pay attorneys to force property owners to give away free rent again, please. Incentivize us to turn those short-term rentals back into long-term rentals. Ma'am, your six minutes has expired. Can I just say one more sentence? Please go ahead. We're in a crisis all together. Only when supply exceeds demand will prices fall. Rotten landlords will get their act together and things will get better. Mom and pop owners are the best way to get that done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bo Revlet, you'll have your three minutes plus a minute 30 from, um, I've forgotten who. Nolan Adams. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And Yes, and thank you all for uh, hearing us speak tonight. We know that it is very late. It's a very late night for us too. We only have a couple of more from Kentucky Tenants. Uh, my name is Bo Revlet. I'm here uh, with Kentucky Tenants in support of a Tenants Bill of Rights. Um, last time we came in October, we only had four speakers. We had everyone else cede their time. We had about as many people in the room as we do today, and we would love to do it like that in general. And we said that we would come back if we did not have action between then and now. And so here we are. And we would love to, again, do it that way more often. Uh, and we appreciate the support that we have received, um, but we're not over the finish line yet. Um, I want to recap a little bit of what has happened tonight. We have heard from three people who are opposed to the Tenants' Bill of Rights, plus four people who ceded time, so that's seven. Uh, I agree with many of the things that were said by uh, Mr. Markham and Ms. Whaley, and I forgot, forgot the other woman's name, Miranda something. Uh, you know, I agree, expand the Affordable Housing Fund, we need more supply. I agree, uh, a moratorium on corporate investors uh, buying up property wherever Ms. Whaley is, I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, incentivizing affordable health development, increasing home ownership, uh, addressing code enforcement problems with more enforcement, including through a landlord registry. I think those are all wonderful ideas. And also they, they've emphasized that they are good landlords and that's wonderful. I, we really appreciate whenever we have a place to stay that is good for us. Um, and you've also heard many stories tonight of people who have experienced bad landlords, people who have experienced bad renting rent conditions, and we would, we would appreciate you encouraging your peers to, to treat tenants better. Um, and so for council, and then on the other hand, I'm the 25th speaker in support of a tenant's bill of rights by my count. Um, this reflects general demographics of the city. 41% of your constituents are renters. Uh, many of your council districts are majority renter. Uh, Nationally, only about 3% of people uh, are landlords, and that's much less than 41%, and uh, of that 3%, only 41% are mom and pop landlords. Uh, the majority are corporate landlords. Um, we don't have any local data on how many people are landlords because we do not have a rental registry. Uh, I want to comment a little bit about what the opponents said tonight. One of the things I want to point out is that no opponent has said anything opposed to uh, tenants being on boards and commissions. Uh, that's great. Uh, Miranda shared the, some concerns about criminal history. Uh, that is one minor part of one of the four parts of what we were pushing for. So, and that, that was the only policy of ours that Miranda addressed. Uh, Mr. Markham, like I said, I, I agreed with many of the things that you said. Uh, I want to point out some uh, and respond to some of the specific other things that you said. One, you said that housing will be less affordable as it is in other places that have passed bans on source of income discrimination. It's factually untrue. Um, there are 11. Excuse me. Can my this gentleman paused? has the podium. 
So uh, there are 11 states that have passed a ban on source of income discrimination. Of those, six of them are in the bottom half of average rent. That's Rhode Island, North Dakota, Wisconsin, Delaware, Maine, and Oklahoma. He cherry picks three examples, California, New York, and Oregon. Those are three expensive places, but they're cherry picked. Um, over half are uh, in the bottom half of affordability. He also listed Louisville. Median rent in Louisville is cheaper than Lexington, even though it's a bigger city. Um, he also mentioned that it would force them out of business. Again, there are 11 states and 50 cities and counties that have passed bans on source of income discrimination. They have not experienced substantial flight uh, of landlords from their cities. It's just untrue. Uh, he also mentioned on the anti-discrimination, the other anti-discrimination parts, he pointed out the national origin is already a protected class. That's correct, but immigration status is not. Uh, again, we spent years talking to attorneys, including fair housing experts about this. Uh, and evictions, he pointed out that renter and rental housing provider have the same access to counsel, which is true, although, Somehow, 90% of landlords end up with a lawyer in eviction court. Only 1% of renters do. Um, he pointed out that most eviction filings do not result in a tenant losing their home. Somewhat true, and that's partially why we don't want eviction history to show up on uh, background checks. Uh, but uh, that's also an undercount because uh, through the eviction filings only account for about one third of total evictions, according to national data. Your uh, can, time has expired. Your four minutes and 30 seconds is gone. Can I close for 30 seconds? That's up to the council. We have a motion. Second. All right. All those in favor of 30 more seconds. Thank you. Um, aye. Aye. <laughs> Anybody opposed? You're good. Thank you. And I just want to share uh, three very, very quick stories, a sentence of people, all of whom I met today, uh, who wanted to be here today and could not. Uh, one is someone who walked into this meeting too late to sign up for public counsel who said, I'm going to be out on the street on Thursday. Another one is someone who I got coffee with earlier, who used to be a very successful basketball player at UK, who was in eviction court last week and only did not get evicted because of a pilot mediation program that we need universally. And one is a tenant from Bowling Green who messaged me and said, are the policies likely to be accepted soon? Unfortunately, my voucher runs out in February, so I'm in a time crunch who has a voucher here in Lexington and no landlord will accept it. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Jeremy Day. Jeremy Day. Frida Downey. Welcome. Welcome, Mayor. How are you doing? Nice Hello to the council. My name is Frida Downey. I am a community advocate. I will not be removing my mask, so I hope you all can hear me. To remove my mask will be a breach in my safety and security. The reason I am here is, first of all, I want to say thank you. When you approach people for information, I like to go with my hand outstretched and shake hands. Even though the situation might be tumultuous, tumultuous at least you're getting to the truth. Mayor, thank you for your information on housing. Now I'm able to go forward and help our community with the housing project. My project, and I also want to thank Mr. Maloney, who is not here with us, but my project is I want to trade handguns in for housing. When the people are talking about mold, mildew, rats, roaches, snakes, squirrels, uh, other pestilence, bed bugs, these things really do exist. Mold can kill people. I'm on my last leg because of a moldy and mildewed environment. What I'd like to do is I need help. I'm here begging for help because I want to demolish a home. The city is allowing me to demolish a home and yet build two homes on one property. I am so thankful for that. So I'm able to help our community with the housing crisis. Please help me facilitate this project. I just need your help. That's all I need. So this is why I'm here today. I also want to say this before I go. To our deaf and blind out there, there's no interpreter here, so I want to say this. We need housing, H-O-U-S-I-N-G. We need housing. We need it to be safe, affordable, we need it to be air quality regulated. We need it to be water quality regulated. It needs smoke detectors. It needs carbon monoxide detectors. And I want you to think about something. These people here are adults. What about our children who are living in these environments? 
that are not eating properly because they don't have a stove that works. They don't have running water. They don't have a lot of things. They can't eat. I have lost a lot of weight because I've been on a hunger strike for housing and our children who live in filth and squalor and nobody is helping them with their electric bedding. How can a child be out here and can't get to school when they haven't slept on a decent mattress? They haven't eaten breakfast and then you wonder why their performance is low. So I'm here to help. I'm here to help the underserved be served. And if you want to help me, reach back for me and pull me through so I can pull my community through. And that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. And Mayor, thank you for all your time and spent with me. And thank you for your courtesy and hospitality to all the council members. Thank you so much. Council members, that finishes our public comment. And I want to thank everyone from the public who came here to speak to us. Now, if the clerk would. I move to uh, separate the question on number 10 for resolutions uh, for a second reading. So move. Second. Council member Ellinger seconds. And do you want that read first? Please. Or, okay. Uh, yes. So the motion is to separate out number 10 and have it read first, and then the others would follow. All right. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? No. All right, we have one no vote. Councilmember Fred Brown, um, if you'll go ahead and give second read to number 10 only. Yes, ma'am. Item 10, a resolution authorizing the Division of Police to purchase automatic license plate reader program from Flock Group Incorporated, a sole source provider, and authorizing the mayor on behalf of the urban county government to execute any necessary agreement with, with Flock Group Incorporated related to the procurement at a cost not to exceed $236,250. Thank you. Thank you. I noticed before we uh, get the motion to approve, Councilmember Lamb has weighed in. Did you want to speak? Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been listening to the, the concerns that have been stated tonight and through all the emails, and while I still do support this, uh, the flock cameras, what I wanted to ask for, and I, <laughs> strangely enough, I'm not sure about incorporating it into a resolution, but basically I want to ask the, that our police chief and that our mayor support um, before the cameras are installed, once they are received, before they're ever installed, that a presentation is brought back, if the chief uh, you know, would bring back a presentation during work session and to go over all of the data through that time. I understand it's gonna be several months before the cameras would be able to be received. You, you have to go through the process of ordering them and then you have to wait for them to come in. So I would suspect that it could be up, upwards of three months. I don't know that factually, and I am going off the cuff here. I don't normally like to do this, but I'm just trying to say that I hear my, my call, we hear and we understand, but I also really strongly believe that this is a good tool, and I, I know that's that so I'm trying to find a compromise, as I always do, and trying to set up that if the, uh, the mayor and the chief would agree to make sure that there is a presentation prior to the, um, the first camera of this next group of cameras, once, they're, once they are received, to have a presentation. And I don't know if this is proper, but I, that's what I'm asking, so. So you're asking for a presentation before the before the 26 camera is installed okay please right. okay the item that was read yes approved. all right is there a second? second this is to item number 10 a motion to approve as we normally would do um all right uh is there anything else you did not make that in the form of a motion I really didn't feel like that it was proper to make it in a form of a motion. Right. It's a okay. request. Okay. So. Well, I think that uh, everyone in here has heard your request. All right. Now, are those of you signed up uh, to speak to the same issue? 
Vice Mayor Kay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to keep this brief, um, and I think it's relatively straightforward as far as I'm concerned. The first point is that um, my reasoning for voting no on this is that the vote is not about the underlying value of the flock cameras. It's not about privacy issues at this point. It's not about effectiveness. It's not about a lot of what we've heard. It's not about the underlying value. What it is about is when do we, when do we evaluate the tool? We have a proposed tool. We have had a, a short um, uh, period to, to understand what it's done so far. But what we don't have is data over time and what we don't have is comparative data. We don't know how what has happened in the interim compares to what happened previous to the interim. We don't have a timeline on this. And so if you put those two things together, we don't have really the basis for a grounded judgment at this time. And I believe that we need to vote no and allow for that to happen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Ellinger. Thank you, Mayor. I guess, uh, and the Chief, you can clarify this for me, is when we, when we do this, are, are we going to be owning the cameras or are we going to be leasing the cameras? And if that's the case, if we're leasing the cameras, will you be coming back in a year and we'll have to put that back in the budget to, to do that again? Commander Greathouse, welcome. So the cameras are leased from Flock themselves, and after a year, we would have to renew uh, our contract. So you'd have to come back to the council then um, to re-up the um, for the budget to to get the cameras again. For FY24, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sheehan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to follow up on Councilmember Lamb's request, I didn't hear a confirmation of whether we could have a presentation before the uh, next set of cameras would be installed if if this moves forward is it possible to have an agreement <coughs> we would be able to come back and give a presentation before the 26th camera would be installed I don't know what the time frame is as far as getting those cameras in, and just for a point of clarification, we wouldn't actually receive those. We don't ever touch them. Flock themselves would actually show up and install those, but we would work with them to make sure that if they have cameras ready, that could be delayed before a presentation is given before you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Legree. Uh, Mayor, I'll make this short. Um, I had a number of questions um, on Tuesday before I made my vote about this issue, and all of those questions still stand, um, hence the vote I'll be making today. And I look forward to receiving more information and to seeing the presentation and to sharing that information with my constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember James Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Lamb, for chiming in and making that request. Um, if this moves forward, I think it's important that we try to continue to communicate um, as best we can to the public what the plan is, what data we're looking at, what we're going to compare it to. And with the item staying in committee, I think it gives us the opportunity to keep evaluating this tool and the measurements that we're going to have in place to justify whether we continue it uh, going forward. So uh, thank you for that, Councilmember Lamb. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Cloyber. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with, with all the metrics that Councilmember James Brown put out there, but I think I will just reiterate that those are things we should do before expanding a program, before committing a quarter of a million dollars to it on an accelerated timeline. We need data, we need information. We cannot say as much as we want to feel it is doing well, we cannot say it is doing well and not doing harm until we have some of that data. So I too will be sticking with my vote from before and voting no against this this evening. And I hope to encourage you all to do the same. Thank you. Any other council comments or questions? 
on item 10. All right, will you uh, please, I think you already read it. <laughs> will you please uh, take a roll call vote? Ms. Lamb? Ms. Lamb? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Ms. Legree? No. Mr. McKern? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Plowman? Yes. Ms. Reynolds? No. Ms. Shan? Yes. Mr. Worley? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Baxter? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Bledsoe? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Fred Brown? Yes. Mr. James Brown? Yes. Mr. Ellinger? Yes, ma'am. Vice Mayor Kay? No. And Mr. Koiper? No, ma'am. Thank you. All right, thank you. That item passed 10-4 with 